Welcome to the Wakefield Country Day School free online summer speaker series. My name is Paul Larner and I'm chairman of the board. Today is the first of our summer series. These presentations are designed to be 30 minutes and they will occur every Wednesday at 5 p.m. over the next seven weeks. You can see our full program in the July 9th edition of Wrap News or at wcdsva.org. The topics are designed to be diverse, relevant, and of broad appeal. Next Wednesday, we will hear from John Geno, manager of Eldon Farm on, quote, raising cattle in Rappahannock County, end quote. I now introduce Welby Griffin, the daughter of the founders of WCDS. Welby knows WCDS in many capacities, valedictorian of her class, teacher, parent of a current student, and member of the WCDS board. She is a summa cum laude graduate of Bryn Mawr College and has spent her entire career teaching Latin, English, and history in independent schools. For the last 13 years, she has taught at WCDS, where she is a prized member of the faculty. With that, I turn it over to Welby Griffin. All right. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank Paul for um, his introduction and for all of his leadership um, this year and last. And Paul was, in fact, um, along on this trip with us, which was fantastic, especially given the trip it turned out to be, it was wonderful to have um, Paul's steady hand and good judgment there as we navigated what became a really interesting situation. And I'd like to thank Jessica Lindstrom for all her support over the years of our trips and all the teachers, including people like um, April and her husband who came along on this trip, who support these trips and you know are taking of the students every places. And of course, the students who have been fantastic travelers, you know, taking a bunch of students abroad is no easy task, but with these guys, it really is, it really is a pleasure. Um, so I'm going to, uh, I'd like to show a side presentation. If Lila, could you enable screen sharing for me? Um, I'm going to walk you through the trip. It looks like it's right now set so that, ah, there we go. All right. So, I have prepared a side presentation of our trip. Um, the trip was titled In the Footsteps of Caesar, and it ended up, in fact, being perhaps even more in the footsteps of Caesar than it originally was intended to when we had to do a little bit of rerouting on the fly. And this trip was designed to explore um, the really rich, fruitful, interesting area of northern Italy where it meets up at what the Romans would have called Cisalpine and Transalpine Gaul. Um, the plains at the foot of the, in the Po River Valley, the Alps, um, Provence, and um, the areas beyond. And it's, it's a little, it's not uh, Tuscany, the part of northern Italy that people most often visit. And um, it gets into a part of France that is lovely as well. So our trip began um, in Sirmione, which is a little town on a little nub of land that extends into uh, Lago di Garda, which is one of the lovely alpine lakes. And what you're seeing here is um, one of the castles built by the Scalieri family. Their name means ladder, and they, they carved ladders on almost everything they did. And it's fantastic because the castle's right out on the water. It has a you can, it's surrounded by water, this boat is sort of going to go under a causeway. Really kind of a fairy tale setting. Um, and it was a great first stop for our crew. It's not far from Milan Airport. And it's a, a lovely place. It has this really interesting microcosm and of sort of almost tropical weather. It has, you can see snow-covered Alps, but you're also seeing palm trees. And even in February when we were there, there were flowers blooming everywhere. So this was our crew of students, and they loved the castle, but being students, they also loved the, the, the pets. Uh, these, this crew of girls found every stray cat, stray dog, duck, goose, 
pigeon, you name it, they found it and made friends. They're very friendly with the local animals. Um, and this is what I mean by the setting of this lake. You can see that you've got crystal clear um, water and then you've got Alps in the background. The last time I was at Sirmione, and Kirsten will remember this because she was with me, um, the whole thing was socked under fog and you couldn't see any of these mountains. So it was a real joy on this trip. We experienced some fantastic weather and we actually got to see this stuff. We walked all along the shore of this area and there's actually a hot spring that bubbles up. Um, and there were people out bathing in this little sulfur pool, even though it was quite cold and um, you know, the water of the rest of the lake was quite chilly. Now, th this area attracted not just people like the Scalieri's in the Middle Ages, but the Romans. Um, the Roman poet Catullus had a house on um, the shores of Lago di Garda. Um, and you can actually see some ruins of it. Um, we didn't have time to do that on this trip, but uh, if you were to travel to Sirmione, um, that would be a neat thing to do. After we left Sir Sirmione, we headed to Verona. And most of us, when we think of Verona, probably the association we have the most is with Romeo and Juliet because it's set there. Now, if you travel, if your tourism aspirations in Verona are to see things related to that, you're not going to see much because uh, it's not even you know, clear whether they really existed. And anything that's been established, such as the House of Juliet, quote unquote, was a later sort of enterprising tourist attempt. Now, Verona does have some fantastic Roman sites. On the left-hand side here, you're seeing um, the interior of the Roman amphitheater. And you're seeing it through, you know, through the same kinds of gates that a Roman would have walked in. You're seeing very much the same view. It really gives you a sense of what it would have felt like to, um, to walk into one of these things, either as a contestant or as a spectator, probably more likely as a spectator from here. And, uh, it's really a fantastically preserved amphitheater. If you've been to the Colosseum in Rome, you'll know that it's a huge letdown to walk into the place and not see any seats or even any floors. You really don't get a sense of what it would have felt like. Whereas here, you have the walls, you have the floors, and you can really get a sense of it. Roman gladiator fights were, um, were really interesting because we tend to assume that they fought to the death every fight, but the Romans were way too clever for that it was very costly to train gladiators. You wouldn't want to kill, you know, half of your workforce every time they went out, you know, on the job. So they would, um, they, they put a lot of theatrics into it. They had a lot of gladiators who fought in wildly different styles and attire. They sort of handicapped them. Like this one would have great armor and that one would have great weapons. The most bizarre type of Roman gladiator is the Andabata, um, which was a gladiator who was heavily armed, heavily armored, but had no eye holes in its helmet. So the, the gladiator had to fight blind. And um, you know, the entertainment value in that was watching, um, watching to see if that person could overcome someone who was much more lightly armed. Gladiator games were based on an earlier Etruscan practice um, of having people fight to the death at funeral games, kind of like the Vikings and the Egyptians, the way that they might bury servants and whatnot. There was the belief that if you had someone rich and famous die, you would um, you know, send them off to the afterlife. And that's how they developed into the games. And the reason I mention that is the Andabata, Fighting Blind, um, is possibly based on an earlier Etruscan game, which is truly one of the most bizarre games I've ever heard of, which involved pitting a man with a bag over his head who had a bat against a dog. Um, same idea, you have one person blind and you're trying to see if they can beat someone else. On the right-hand side, you have um, one of the main gates of the city in Verona, and this is a fantastically preserved um, piece of work. Really, you know, I, I travel the world looking for Roman stuff, and there are not too many you see that are in this good a shape. That whatever stone they use here has survived the test of time really well, and it's been built right into the street of Verona. Verona has a lot of lovely walking streets. Here's another um, beautiful piece. This is a uh, triumphal arch of some sort. And under it, you can still see the original Roman pavement and you can see the, uh, the chariot and wagon wheel tracks in the, in the stonework. And I always find that to be so evocative when you get that, um, and I love that. Verona is also a great spot to go to see sort of Renaissance uh, items. The Scalieri family was here too, and they added many wonderful things to this city.
Um, here is one of the Scalieri palaces, and you have um, their distinctive dovetail crenellations. Anytime you see this particular style of crenellation, you're seeing a building that was owned by the Scalieri. The next day, we headed um, to the Scrivangi Chapel in Padova, and um, after that on to Venice, where we spent the rest of that day and the next day. So Scrivangi Chapel is extremely difficult to get into because it can only allows people in for very short periods and um, in small groups. And we actually had a kind of interesting experience on our way there. We, our group got separated, half the group got a little turned around, we missed our appointment and we had to sort of beg them to let us into this hermetically sealed, they have sort of airlock. They take you into a little chamber and then another chamber. And we were exceedingly lucky that we eventually all got in. And all this care is because the fresco, which was painted by Giotto in the beginning of the 1300s, is really rare. And what's so special about this was Giotto was prefiguring the Renaissance about 100 years before it actually happened, or at least a good 50 or 60. And um, it's a fantastic uh, piece of work. Lots, he's famous for his level of realism in terms of facial expressions, realism in terms of clothing details, at a time when the rest of the world was still making art that looked a lot like Byzantine iconography, he was starting to get the humanism of it. Now in this particular photo there's a really cute detail that I just love, which is up at, on either side of the window um, there are angels and they're doing something pretty funny. This picture is showing, um, showing the end times and Jesus on his throne. And because the world is over and we're moving on, uh, the heavens are getting rolled up and the angels are rolling the skies up like a carpet um, for the second coming and it's just hysterical. Here's a detail of one of these pieces and you can see the level of expression, um, the, the richly detailed clothing, the shadows, the highlights, all of this not present anywhere else at this time and not really for the next 50, 60 years. Um, Padova, it was a town I'd never been to before, but I'd like to go back. It had some lovely little areas like this large um, oval, uh, I guess you'd call it a piazza, right by a, a church. I think it's San Antonio. It was a pilgrimage church, and this was probably part of what the pilgrims came. They probably walked around this but really a lovely space. They also had a lot of covered galleries. A neat town that's not really on the major sort of tourist track, but well worth going to. Now a town that really is on the tourist tra track is our next stop, Venice. Um, and uh, it did not disappoint. It was really nice. Um, we stayed in Venice, which was something that we don't always do because it's tricky to find a good hotel. But that allows you to get away from the, the areas that are just inundated with the day trippers. Um, on the right hand side, this is a, probably my favorite piazza I've ever discovered in Venice. I had not been there before this trip. It's the um, Piazza of the Scuola Grande di San Rocco, um, which was a, a school for artists. And it's this lovely area of town that's not on the pathway from the train station to the Rialto or to San Marco. And so you're getting a lot more of the locals. You'll see, you know, little shops that people clearly shop in. And it's just, it's lovely. It didn't capture well in photos. It was too close in, but it was really a lovely spot. Now, the best thing about our trip to Venice was it was Carnivale, which in fact got canceled the day after we left. So we were exceedingly lucky that we hit it. And there were people everywhere in costume. And I, I knew intellectually about Carnivale, but you kind of have to see it to really experience what it's all about. And these two guys are having a photo shoot in the Scuola. Um, and it's just fantastic because you get a sense of what, you know, it looked like in the day and the time. And this is the rest of their crew. And these are just regular people. They're not actors, they haven't been hired. They just have spent who knows how much on these costumes. And now they're out parading around, they're making the day of it. They'll stop, they'll pose for pictures, they'll preen, they love it. And these costumes are just out of this world. Um, these are some more costumes. I took a lot of people pictures um, because they were just such fun. and. You know, when I heard that we were going to be there during Carnival, at first I was like, oh, this is going to be going to be so many tourists, it's going to be such a hassle. But it was absolutely worth every moment. They have little twinkle lights set on all the little narrow streets, and then you have all of these folks just parading around. Um, 
and this is just, you know, these are just the ones that I could, could capture. There were many, many more. Um, one of the nice things, again, about staying was we had a little bit more time to get off the beaten track. And definitely a part of Venice that is well worth going to if you travel there is what's pictured on the left. This is the Jewish ghetto. It's a much quieter part of town, very serene, great for just sort of poking your head here, poking your head there. Um, and really just a, a great um, place if you want to not feel like you're in the sort of tourist treadmill that Venice can sometimes be like on the main drags. Another great way to get away from it all in Venice is to go to the island of Murano. Um, and that's what we did on our second morning. We went out to go to the glass factory. Um, and a very chill place Murano is compared to the mainland. Now, my favorite thing that we discovered on Murano was, was one of those accidental discoveries, and those are always the best. And that was this Romanesque basilica, which had a fantastic inlaid floor from the fourth or fifth century. Um, so that was a, a lovely and unexpected find. The next day, we went to Florence. Um, this is a shot taken from the Campanile looking down at the Duomo, um, Santa Maria della Fiore. Um, then, of course, we have the, uh, the you've got to hit the Ponte Vecchio um, and the Piazza. And Florence was less crowded than it usually would be because February does turn out to be a fantastic time. Um, but still, the kids did not enjoy Florence as much as some other places. It's, it's tough. Florence has become such a, so, it's so popular for its own good, it can be a little bit hard to enjoy. If you do go there, I highly recommend um, the gardens. Now, the ones that you always hear about are the Piazza, or the Giorgini um, Boboli. But these pictures I took actually in the um, Giardini Barberini, which are next door. And I found them to be they're more heavily planted and they give out onto these wonderful views. Um, I have two shots here that are actually showing slightly different views of Fiesole, um, the hill nearby Florence that's really famous for being a good overlook. Um, and it was just, it, it made you, even though Florence is quite a large and developed town, when you went there, you could feel like you were getting away from it all. Um, this is a shot of the Duomo looking down from the Giardini uh, Barberini. Um, we had a fantastic sunset over the Duomo. And this is about when our trip plans really started to take a turn because that was the day that they shut down um, Milan and, put, and it be, was announced that there had been some outbreaks of COVID and that the city of Milan was gonna go into a shutdown. And that meant that we had to come up with a new plan because we were supposed to spend the second part of our trip in Milan. So that evening after the sun went down, we were frantically rescheduling the end of our trip so that we would be as far away as possible from what was happening. You know, little did we know that it was going to come to us soon enough. The next day we went to a town which always tends to be a crowd favorite, which is the town of Siena. A great rival of Florence, a little less well known, but certainly super, you know, worth the visit and certainly well regarded in its own right. This is, um, this is the main, you can't call it a square because it's, it's more like a scallop shell shaped space in Vienna. This is where they do the famous horse race, the Pia Palio, I think it is. Um, they, the different sectors of town all sponsor horses, they race around. Um, a really neat um, event. Siena's Cathedral defies description. It's really one of a kind, one of the most exuberant uh, things you've ever seen. Now, the outside of the Duomo in Florence is a really impressive building, but the inside, it turns out, is quite plain. Siena, they brought the same sort of glitz of the outside into the inside. In Florence, it's all in pink and green marbles. Siena went full-on zebra stripe, which means that it can be a little bit of sensory overload, considering that the floors are also inlaid in elaborate marble, but it's incredible. And the most interesting thing about Siena is it's actually much smaller than it was supposed to be. This church as it exists was supposed to be only a transept of a much larger church. They were going and they were going big, but then the plague broke out and they had to scratch the plans. That day we also went to this little hill town called San Gimignano, which I think I slaughter the pronunciation every time I say this. This town is famous because of these weird towers. Um, the locals got into sort of a one-upmanship, like literally one-upmanship, going up, building these 72 at the peak towers that, you know, are like 100 feet tall. 
Now, this is interesting because this is an earthquake zone, but 14 of the towers have managed to survive. And I was stupid enough to actually go up in one of these things, you know, even in this earthquake zone. Um, you get fantastic views. This was a great place to go in February because it's a very small town, very beautiful, this view um, in the town, but would be completely overrun at any other time of year. Here's a view looking down from the town. That night we stayed in Lucca. This is the site of an old Roman amphitheater. The town has actually been built um, right around the curve of the old amphitheater. Um, here is a picture of the Duomo in Lucca, which is a great example of um, Italian Romanesque, which is unlike pretty much any other form of it. Now, another thing we did that day, which was another joy of traveling during uh, this time of year, during Carnavale, was on our way to France, we stopped at the town of Menton, where they were having the Fête du Citron, which was developed in 1895 as an effort to get wintertime tourist business and to take advantage of the fact that that's when they harvest their oranges and their lemons. And it's this festival where they make these gigantic float, they're not even floats, installations out of lemons and oranges. Smelled fantastic, looked incredible. Every year they have a different theme. This year it was holidays around the world. And you can see, I think it's Day of the Dead on the left. And that other one is from Australia and I'm not sure what the festival it is. But they had, they had an Oktoberfest one, they had all kinds of things. Um, and it's one of a couple of festivals that involve citrus um, in this part of the world that happened right before, uh, before Lent. Beautiful town on the coast, beautiful flowers interspersed with the lemons. This fete was closed down the day after we um, saw it, so we squeaked in under the wire. The next day we headed into Provence um, with stops here at the Pont du Gard in Avignon, which was where the popes um, fled to under Pope Clement. In the 1300s, they built this gigantic palace. Um, it's very interesting. They have a really good interactive display. Um, one of the largest palaces you'll see anywhere. We also went that evening to Nîmes, <clears throat> where we saw another amphitheater. This one is particularly well preserved on the outside. Now, Nîmes is most famous for this amphitheater and for this building, the Maison Carré, which is probably the best preserved Roman temple anywhere. Um, but it also has a brand new Gallo-Roman Museum, which is really fantastic. Um, there are many places in the world that have fantastic collections of Roman artifacts, but this one interprets them in a way that really contextualizes them and helps you understand the culture and the people. And that makes it well worth a visit for anyone. Neem also has lovely canals, fountains, really a nice stop. The next day we had a kind of long drive on our hands. We were headed to um, Geneva to go to CERN, um, the site of the gigantic Hadron Collider. And while we were there, we were lucky enough to have a tour. It's hard to get a tour of CERN. And the gentleman who gave it to us um, has himself worked there for 20, 30 years. He was extremely knowledgeable. And here's the group. It's hard to take pictures of this kind of thing. A Hadron Collider does not photograph well. Um, and I won't even try to describe the science behind it because I barely have my mind wrapped around it, but it was, really fascinating to, um, to see something like that, very different from a lot of the other things on the itinerary, and uh, definitely very educational. Um, the next day was when we were really beginning to operate an improvisation zone, because we were supposed to be heading south into Milan this day, and clearly we were not. So instead, we turned for the north and went along the shores of Lake Geneva, um, to the city of Lausanne. And the, my favorite thing to see in Lausanne is this attraction, which is the Museum of the Olympic Movement. And it's a really wonderful um, place that covers the history of the Olympics. It has all kinds of mementos from the Olympics, all kinds of interactive displays. And um, I just had a fantastic time reliving all the Olympics of my childhood. Um, and it looks like I have a duplicate picture, sorry. Um, this is, this is, this is Lake Geneva. It looks like a, looks like a set drop, not an actual lake of so beautiful and so blue. Um, this is in, um, Bern, where we stopped that evening. That's the capital of Switzerland. Doesn't feel like the capital of anything. Very kind of small, quaint, beautiful town, tidy as can be. It's really famous for its fountains, and on the left is one of those fountains. Um, the, that night we stayed in Strasbourg, and this is one of the elaborate clocks in the Strasbourg Cathedral. 
Strasbourg is this great um, fusion of German and French, um, having been kicked back and forth like a soccer ball by, between the two countries um, in, in the region of Alsace. You can see that you're definitely getting sort of a German feel in the buildings. Um, and uh, here as well, a really lovely town. They had some of the most fantastic bakeries and food you could possibly imagine. Tom and I bought enough picnic food to last us more days than we had left on the trip. And we actually took it by train with us to Paris and had a, a picnic in our little efficiency apartment that we had in Paris. Um, because that's where we ended up. Um, because that was the place that we could book a flight home out of. So even though the trip had in no way intended to begin with Paris, just like Julius Caesar, we found ourselves deep into Gaul. Um, and we took advantage of it. We went to Saint-Chapelle, more famous for its upstairs, but I love the vaulting and the downstairs as well. Um, and here's a, a shot of those lovely uh, stained glass windows for which it's so famous in the upstairs. That afternoon, we headed out to Versailles, where as Tom and I enjoyed the gardens, it began to pour. We can't really tell that from the picture, but the heavens are in the process of opening, and we very soon would look like utterly drowned rats. Versailles, there's so much you can do with the palace, but, and this is a shot of one of the rooms of one of the outer palaces, that's like a little summer cottage or something, but it's also a lot of fun to do the gardens and to see in particular, whoops, um, this, which is Marie Antoinette's play village that she had built. You can see that the set designers of uh, Beauty and the Beast, the animated movie, must have taken a little tour through here because it looks almost exactly like Belle's father's cottage. Um, but really a fun place to spend some time. Um, that evening we went to the Eiffel Tower and um, the next day we flew home. And even though it wasn't the trip we had intended to take, uh, it was a fantastic trip. And, you know, in retrospect, looking back on how sequestered we've all been since, it was, we were so very lucky and so very grateful that we got this chance to spend this time doing what we wouldn't realize was going to become, you know, unthinkable. So that was our trip. And that brings us to the question and answer um, portion of this. Anybody have any questions? I have a question, Welby. Sure. In, um, I believe it was on the island of, was it Moreno, where they had the zebra um, mm. columns? That was in Siena. Siena. Is that um, characteristic of a certain group or time period? Um, I that that's in other cathedral south somewhere, and I was just curious. Yeah, that's a sort of Italian uh, Gothic. It's kind of on the... They started that in the Romanesque era when the, the zebra striping would have been more sort of typical. But since the, it didn't finish until the 1300s, they were well into Gothic and they just kept with it. Um, but you do see that in various places around Italy, but I, I found it more in the north than the south in my travel experiences. Thank you. You're welcome. Well, it's not a question, Welby, but gorgeous just pictures. It is just wonderful to relive that trip. And I took some notes to, you know, remind me of some of the, the right. um, things that we learned. But um, it was just, that was a wonderful recap. And as everybody can see that watch it, Welby does such a great job, Welby and Tom, of making it a really interesting thing. You learn so much and see so much. If you ever can take a Welby Tom trip, do it. As you can see, it's just amazing. Thank you. I'm looking Thank you. forward to watching it again. To, <laughs> to relive the moments. Oh, well, a shout out is well deserved by Douglas, who was a huge help in preparing educational materials for this trip. He prepared a whole booklet. Um, he designed um, and produced maps, um, selected readings. It really was a, a, a wonderful job um, to help provide supplementary materials for the trip. And it just warms my heart that our Wakefield graduates, you know, are so capable. Um, and, it, you know, it's a nice little memento to have and uh, can't wait to have him do that again for our next venture. And I enjoy looking back and, um, you know, remembering what we've seen for sure. And it's nice to have this opportunity to present because usually we would have given some sort of presentation in assembly with a lot more pictures and such of the kids. 
but that never got to happen. So we didn't get the closure that you usually get on a trip. So maybe next year in school. Year. I'd like to give a shout out too to Peggy, um, um, who is here in attendance. Peggy is uh, a friend of Paul's and she and her husband, Jim, joined us on this trip and they were just the most delightful travel companions. Never, never a crossword out of Peggy. She could see the silver side of any situation and was just a lot of fun to have along and travel with. And I hope when normalcy is restored, she might consider coming with us again to uh, someplace. Who knows when that will be. Well, be as I understand. Go ahead. Oh. Uh, just an organizational type question. Um, it sounds like you had to um, very quickly um, secure some uh, overnight stay in Paris. Just right. how, how did that, how did you yeah. know, where did you um, get a plane? <laughs> well, first of all, you know, the wonders of iPhones, um, you know, if we had not had the ability to stay connected on this trip, it would have been disastrous. But Tom had been to Paris a few times in the past few years, so he certainly knew the area of town that we wanted to be. And then it just involved, uh, Brent, I'm not doing, involved hours. Um, every time we were on a bus, other people were looking out the windows. Um, and a shout out to Brendan, who has been um, wet vacuuming the gymnasium for the past um, two hours. So oh. that, that's good work on Brendan's part. And the, actually, my, the rest of my family has been hard at work on that as well. Um, but when everybody else was looking out the windows, we were hunched over our phones reading hotel reviews. Um, luckily, if you're gonna have to get a last minute booking for you know, 30 people, February is the time to be doing it, not you know, summer. But the uh, hotel we uh, found was, um, it was a find. I would go there again for sure, because Paris, Brendan, please be quiet, is um, a tough hotel scene and you can get some really rough places. And that one was, that one was, well located so it was mainly carrie just hours of careful research um on the bus while we had a chance <laughs> no we, magic bullet okay no no magic bullet and the minute we saw the handwriting on the wall which was about four or five days before you know we set up like a battle station in our bedroom that night we had douglas on the phone douglas we need some remote research we need you to look into some things yeah. you know what are some we yeah, need some it's not like it's just one family you're looking for 30 people right so. right Another thing that was very helpful was this part of the world was an area that Tom and I lived for an entire summer. When Tom was in graduate school, um, he did a program with Bocconi in Milan and he had to do an internship with Prudential. So when Douglas was a babe in arms, we spent a summer in an apartment in Milan and it was the wettest summer on record and the mosquito population was just through the roof. And Italians believe neither in air conditioning nor in window screens, which means if you're me or Douglas, you're basically a human offering for mosquitoes. So we spent every weekend trying to get out of Milan so that we would not, you know, somebody thought Douglas had chicken pox on a number of occasions because of our mosquito bite, you know, numbers. So we kept on fleeing into the Alps, into Provence, anywhere where it wasn't raining and there weren't mosquitoes and it wasn't 98 degrees. And we had had a lot of experience with all of the areas around there. So when we had to come up with a new plan on the fly, we had some ideas mm. <laughs> because we'd done it. So that was helpful. Yeah. For sure. Well, we, yeah. Uh, how, how would you say the weather compared um, between the two trips when we went and then when you went in February? Because March was so, it was so beautiful. You know. It was warm. I was just wondering, February it was, could be a little cold. It was not warm, warm, but it wasn't cold either. It was pleasant. Um, it was, there were a couple days, there was a day in Florence where it, they swore it was going to be in the 60s or 70s, and all the kids went out in shirt sleeves. I froze my tail off that entire day. Whatever 60 they were talking about was not my 60. And, but, you know, the weather was usually in the 50s or 60s. It was not that cold. There were a good amount of flowers. And it was certainly, you know, the reason we moved the trip to this time slot was because, of, remember Kirsten, how incredibly crowded, like Verona, you could barely, you know, wait. Oh, yeah, wait. so crowded. Right, so and crowded. this was fantastic. It was, you had all these places virtually to yourself um, or light crowds, and that made it all worthwhile. You didn't get quite the basking in the sun kind of thing. 
but it was warm enough that you could definitely justify some gelato, you know, maybe even several times a day, depending on where yeah. you <laughs> Depending how good the stand looked. <laughs> And it was sunnier for, on this trip. You know, I, I feel like as we were sitting there watching the world kind of crumble around us, little do we know how crazy things were going to get. The weather seemed to be saying, like, here's a little peace offering. You know, your entire trip itinerary just got shot to heck, but you're going to get some great photos out of this one because they're going to be bluebird skies for five days in a row. So I don't know. Nature seemed to be offering, a, you know, olive branch, even if nothing else was. So. <laughs> Anything else? Paul, you, you were going to say something? No, I just want to commend you and Tom again for a fantastic trip. And as I understand it, periodically you lead a trip to the south, southern part of Italy. And um, we'll all have to look forward to joining you again on that event. Oh, yes. That one is incredible. Um, Tom has worked so hard on both the itineraries, but the southern itinerary is his pride and joy. And you know, that's a part of the world that is not nearly as well known, but just has so much to offer, especially in terms of the food, the diversity of sites. April went along on that last trip, and whenever we can get back to those parts, you know, at the soonest it would be the year after next, you know, I really hope that we can. Right. And Kirsten, yeah, no, that was great. Yeah. yeah. Wonderful so. trip, too. That was fabulous. Well, if there are no other questions, Welby, uh, thank you for introducing some of us to uh, Northern Italy and Southern France and allowing the rest of us to relive a truly enjoyable 11 day period, notwithstanding the logistics. I'll welcome. just disclose by reminding everyone that we've got another six speakers coming up and you can find out about them either at our website or in last week's edition of Rap News. Um, it's an intriguing collection of topics of a very diverse nature, and we hope you'll attend and tell your friends about it. Thanks again, Welby. You're very welcome. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Appreciate it. Thank you, Welby. Thank you. Welcome. That was great. Thank you, Welby. Thank you, Welby. It was great. Bye. You're welcome. Bye. Thank, Thank you, you Welby.